in um, 2003, 2004, I went to Congo and I was doing an article for an organization called Human Rights Watch on the exploitation of natural resources in Eastern Congo. And I took this image, which became their kind of go-to image for the natural resource exploitation in Eastern Congo. These children were being used in mines to extract gold that was then used by the rebels to finance the war in Eastern Congo. When the children weren't forced to work in the mines, they were forced to carry Kalashnikovs and fight as child soldiers to continue the fight for the warlords to amass yet more wealth so that this fight continued. But thankfully, Human Rights Watch intervened and uh, engaged the Swiss gold mining company, Metalore Technologies, that was extracting or helping to extract and also buying the gold from Eastern Congo. And Human Rights Watch, with these pictures and their report, forced Metal or Technologies to pull out of buying gold from Eastern Congo, $150 million worth of gold purchasing in Eastern Congo that was financing warlords stopped overnight. That's the power of photography. National Geographic thought they had great vision, I think, that they can do the same thing because this war isn't over. Now it's not just gold that's been extracted in Eastern Congo, but young children like this. This image was taken in March of this year. And these children are fighting for a warlord called Cobra Matata, who is still extracting gold in Eastern Congo. But now this gold is being used in our electronic products. It's not just gold, but it's tin, tantalum, tungsten. All of these products are being used in our electronic products. And we all use them today. I use them in my cameras. I use them in my mobile phone. I use them in my laptop. This young girl, you see, she's fighting for a Mai Mai group. They believe that bullets will drop off them like water. And you can see the skirt underneath her uniform there. That's her school uniform. This young boy is 11. He thinks that bullets will also drop off him like water, but believe me, they don't. When the fighting subsides, most of the children are forced then to go back into the mines. Again, this image was taken in January this year when we went back for National Geographic. And this boy is extracting gold and tin from this area in Pluto in northeastern Congo. And this child, he's 13, 14 years old. The children, they live in the mines. They're forced to work in the mines 12 hours a day, but then they sleep there. So their, their toil doesn't stop when night falls. They curl up in their tent just at the edge of the mine and get up in the morning and carry on working. The gold that's extracted and the tin that's extracted and the tungsten that's extracted is then taken to the borders of Congo and exported through the border countries of Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi, and then shipped to the Far East. This is a gold mine that has collapsed, and this mine is called La Souffrance in French, which means sufferance, and you can see why. This is a gold mine as well in northeastern Congo. All of these people are a mixture of civilians and military extracting gold. Again, this gold will be shipped to the border of Uganda this time around, sold to the military in Uganda, and that money will be used to finance both weapons purchases and further exploitation of gold. So this is what happens. The gold, the tungsten, the tin, the tantalum starts in eastern Congo and goes to the neighboring countries and then is shipped to the coastal regions which, and then put on a ship. It ends up in smelters and production factories in Asia when it's turned into electronic products. Those electronic products are then shipped to stores around the world and we buy them. So we are complicit in this conflict more than anyone. We have a responsibility more than anyone to engage and increase our knowledge about this conflict so that it stops. The impact of this war on the Congolese is devastating. Two million people at any one time have been displaced. Over the last 15 years, 5.5 million people have died in Eastern Congo. That's more than the population of Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan combined. Women often have to flee these areas alone, and they end up building their homes and trying to find a, a safe space for their family in the displaced camps. This is taken in Goma, which is under the shadow of this volcano, an active volcano in eastern Congo, last erupted in 2001. The camps grow to massive sizes. People live very, very close to each other. And in the rainy season, cholera is devastating. And the last time I was visiting this area, this was during a cholera epidemic. And within three weeks, 250 people had died of cholera. The children that are forced to live in these conditions then try to find some small amount of shelter their families can try to provide for them. 
and this young boy is living in a displaced camp in Goma again. One of the most devastating things that I've ever seen in Eastern Congo is the worst weapon that is used, and that's sexual violence. And uh, an American institution recently finished a survey and concluded that there were 40,000 women being raped every year in Eastern Congo. 40% of every women, of 40% of all women in Eastern Congo will at some point in their life experience sexual violence. And this woman, she's 15 years old and she's there. She was abducted by the rebels and taken to the bush, forced to be a sex slave for the soldiers. And she's here now, she escaped luckily, and she's here now in a shelter in Goma with her child of 18 months, and the girl is 15 years old. On the top right hand side there, you see the statistics. The admissions into this sexual violence clinic for 2013, you see the total at the bottom, 540 people have been admitted into this clinic for sexual violence. I took this image on the 28th of January of this year. We mentioned this number of 5.5 million people that have died as a result of this conflict since 1998. And not many of them have died by the bullet or the gun. Violence only accounts for maybe 5% of that number. Most of the people have died because of lack of access to medication, lack of access to an aspirin, lack of access to drugs that will treat diarrhea for children, that will treat malaria. And this has taken deep in rebel territory. Well, we saw the first image with the young child soldiers that were working for Cobra Matata. And these people are in a hospital deep in that rebel territory, and they're waiting for drugs. There wasn't even an aspirin in this hospital when I took this picture. And that's really the, the, the devastating impact that this conflict has had on the population, is that the fundamental breakdown of the health service, the fundamental breakdown of anything that can support the local population, all because people want natural resources. And the most devastating impact, the most devastating thing that you see as a photographer in this particular part of the world is when you see children that could have survived, children that could have recovered from diarrhea or could have recovered from malaria or anemia. This child, Alexandrine, her name was, was six months old. She died of cholera, very treatable, but just because of the conditions in the camps, of the conditions in Eastern Congo, she passed away. And maybe when we leave this auditorium, think quite deeply about how implicated we all are in this conflict. I'm not saying don't buy any of these products. I'm not saying don't use any of these products. Quite the opposite. Local Congolese people need these minerals. It's, they're theirs, you know. They, they, this is part of their national wealth and they should exploit it, but they should exploit it safely and the, and the electronics companies should, should be engaged in that, I think. And, and the hope is that this body of work, along with National Geographic and the engagement that they can bring power that they can bring through photography to this argument, maybe one day we can actually buy a smartphone or a computer or a camera or a television that is stamped conflict-free. Thank you.